Welcome to the Health and Happiness Show. Here we are, it's May, it, weather can be sunshine, it can be cold, but it is springtime. So we have to take time to enjoy the weather and hopefully many of you are uh, preparing for your garden and the summertime to be near here soon. So we are doing our recording today, the first part of May, so of course we are having 30, 40 degree weather. So uh, before we uh, get started on our One Healthy Minute, I just want to tell you that um, I am a doctor of naturopath and uh, what we do is we try to get to the root cause of what your issues are when you come in for a consultation. And how we do that is we do iridology and that is where we go in and look in the iris and it tells us your strength and our weaknesses. And many things that we're seeing today is that, uh, here's the iridology chart as well, and this relates to your body, and it gives us a guide. And um, what we're finding today is people are too, too acidic internally, and that comes from stress, coffee, soda pop. And uh, when we're too acidic, that is when disease begins. So we have to be pretty much the CEO of our body so we can keep our body in balance. And so, um, also we do a newsletter every month, and of course, being May, springtime, it's springtime cleaning. So we have to clean our body internally. Many times people take better care of their car. You know, they wash it, they clean the inside, they make sure the filter's working, everything is working properly. And when that red light comes on, what do they do? They go to the garage and get it fixed. So we have to listen and be in tune to our body. And I feel as though being in the holistic field that our disease today is coming from standard American diet because the way we're eating today is so different than when we were eating 100 years ago. And uh, also I feel as though it's coming from the toxins. We have GMOs, we have our technology, the, you know, the radiation rays, everything. So we're exposed to many, many different things. So we have to go in and do a cleanse and there's many different choices. And when clients come in, if they're toxic, we can tell by looking in their irises as well, then we will put them on a cleanse. And when you do a cleanse, you can't expect to do just a one-time cleanse because we're exposed to toxins on a regular basis. So what we have to do is the best way to remember it is try to do a cleanse every season change. So here we are, we're in springtime. My favorite is the Tahi cleanse. You've heard me talk about that before. It's more systemic. I don't personally like just a colon cleanse. We gotta take care of the, of course, the liver. And then we have burdock in it, which cleans your blood as well. And then we have an all cell detox to clean at the cellular level. And of course we have a uh, black walnut for parasites, just in case. And then we also have some LBS2 for open up the colon as well. And of course you need to drink good quality water, not the chemical cocktail coming out of the faucet. You need to get good quality water. I know we have the Coggin water machine. I don't expect you to do that, but you need to go get uh, a filter or uh, especially for your shower because whenever you have city water, your body's absorbing those chemicals as well. So I send my clients to the uh, True Value in Hartville to get a filter for their shower, which is less than $100. And then you change the little cube in it like probably every three or four months. We have well water. I still do that because I have so much industry around me, I really don't trust the water as well. So, you know, that's kind of what it's all about. So we have to keep our body in balance is one thing I want you to remember today. And that is nutrition, E for exercise, and we need to control our stress. We're seeing so many people with stress today with the unknown, and then we need to have sufficient sleep. And then of course, attitude is very critical as well. So here we are in springtime. And so hopefully, you know, I brought a couple of the plants along. Of course, they're sitting on the deck right now and they're not too happy with the weather. So I bring them in at night whenever it's going to get down to below 32. And we have the pepper and the tomatoes. So all you have to do is you don't have to start everything from seed. You can go to a greenhouse like over to uh, Cindy Petiti's uh, over in Louisville, which we've had on the show. She has all organic plants as well. And there's many greenhouses around. So usually by the 
after Memorial Day, it's safe to put these outside. Now, I personally have a couple, uh, my lettuce is up like two or three inches already. My mother had always told me, you plant your lettuce on St. Patty's Day. It likes the cold weather, so mine is up like two to three inches already. So uh, you can put the tomatoes in a pot, which I put my lettuce in the pot on my deck, and you can keep an eye on that as well. And you can put your tomato plants out. Yes, I did put some out, one out two weeks ago. I didn't cover it up and I lost it. So I'm going to probably keep an eye on the weather and put one of these in the pot as well whenever I feel as though it's a little more stable in the evening as far as weather goes. So on the One Healthy Minute, <clears throat> you know, here we are, springtime. You know what that means. That means that we are having a lot of different parasites, like maybe ticks coming out today. I know we have a miniature Dotson. I have found ticks on her at least twice in the last week. So, and uh, for your animals, I have a special color that has different herbs on it to help repel the ticks as well. But I can't totally trust that. So we have the tick spray here that I put on her before we go out. And then we have the powder with yarrow and diatomaceous powder in it as well. And I'm just saying these are options. I personally choose not to give her the uh, tablets against fleas and, and ticks. I, that's just my choice. So I'm just saying these are alternative choices if you choose to do that. So um, let's go in and talk about uh, the ticks a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you our guest today. We are very honored to have Dr. Albert Miller. Thank you, Albert, for taking the time. Thank today. you for having me on the show. That's good. It's my pleasure. Just, we'll get ahead of the show, but anyway, he has written a book, You Can't Do That. And so we're going to get into that after we talk about the ticks. Sounds like a plan, right? Sounds good. <laughs> okay. So the ticks, you know, I feel it's best to try to keep the immune system strong. And I like to take my zinc every other day, being a woman, but I feel as though Men can take it every day as well. And I like to take elderberry defense, which has a little bit of vitamin D, it has a little bit of olive leaf as well. And so I try to keep the immune system strong. And then like <clears throat> for the Minnie, our little dog, who had the ticks on her, the one was very enlarged, so it had been on her for a while, I'm assuming. And then uh, after we got it out, you put, and I'm gonna show you a picture of the tick as well. <clears throat> And of course, there's small ones and there's large ones. And there's different ones. The deer tick are a little bit smaller. And so here's a picture of it as well. That's what your tick looks like. And then whenever it's attached, it puffs up and gets really big. And uh, how do we remove it? You get tweezers and you get a hold of it and you pull it straight up. You want to get the mouth of the tick out because otherwise it can stay in there and then it can... Um, slowly go in and put the poison into your system. So what can you tell me about medically? What do we do about our ticks? I know you're an emergency ER doc mm -hmm. in Alabama, and you don't see many ticks there, correct? We don't see very many, but the ticks have moved down into the Tennessee area. Yes. And so a lot of our people go up to the Appalachian Mountains. Yes. And so we are being educated a little bit more about that. Right. Um, but what I have... Uh, here in front of me is does some articles from up to date and the, uh, medicine is very different today yes anything you want to do know you just go online and look at it uh, there are, it's very rare that we refer to any textbooks but I thought I'd just review it a little bit about the ticks and what people might want to know about it from that um, the ticks of course cause Lyme disease right. but not all bites will cause Lyme disease right. and Lyme disease I, I'm not too sure if you mentioned uh, if, if you get that you'll see a uh, rash with a center pallor and a surrounding right. redness a, a yeah. bu uh, bullet point kind of thing. yeah it looks like a bullseye in a yeah. way kind of yeah but in there are a total of six different species of uh, ticks that cause Lyme disease oh. and the, in the United States there are two primary ones. Mm -hmm. One is more dominant. In, uh, I'm just going to read a, a little bit of this. Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disease in the United States mm -hmm. and Europe. It is a bacterial infection caused by a total of six species, but like I mentioned, two here. 
And, and in North America, it's primarily um, Borkdorfi is, okay. is the primary, and um, Myonia is the second one that causes it. The natural reservoir for the, uh, uh, the, the bacteria to be growing in or <laughs> living in and being happy in is uh, small mammals, deer, Although this article says it's not in deer, right. but uh, it, it is, that's what we were always taught, and birds. It doesn't appear to harm them. It just lives there, reproduces there. In humans, it will cause infection. And the, the most common infection is the skin infection. The idea is if you see that uh, lesion and you treat that, you are not too likely to have long-term effects. Where the long-term effects will come in is when that is not treated and it can spread to really any uh, organ but it, it can be the the heart is probably the most um, devastating one when it does happen right. and it can also cause a thick skin reaction and, and cause a very thick skin infection so what are the treatments the the three main antibiotics that we use. Doxycycline is usually the first choice if one is not allergic to it. Amoxicillin mm -hmm. and then ceftin or a similar cephalosporin is, is often used. The length of treatment, if you see it when it's just in the skin, is gonna be 10 to 14 days. I usually will go 14 days. If however you fail to get your treatment during that time and you start having uh, systemic symptoms. symptoms. Yeah. And at that point in time, typically that's diagnosed with a bunch of uh, blood tests that will look for <coughs> antigens that the body has created to, right. to be fighting this. Uh, then you need to be treated for longer, sometimes three weeks, sometimes all the way up to six weeks, especially if it involves the heart. Uh, if it involves the heart, it can cause a, a heart block or an irregular heart rhythm. Right. And uh, the treatment in some places that I read should go on until that rhythm resolves. Right, so right, interesting. That's so the thing is prevention here. So what you have to do is be on guard. Like if you're going to go out and go for a walk, you know, you're gonna to have to do a chick check, you know, I mean, before you take your shower at night or whatever, you're gonna to have to check everything, wear some boots, wear some socks, you know, just check everything. And especially for your animals as well. May it be a cat outside, a dog outside, you know, I mean, and our dog is already has a black coat, so I have to really go through and check her. And especially they tend to be around the ears is what I'm noticing. And so I always put the powder on before we go out for our walk and, you know, really rub that in. And we have to do that every day as well. And then also she had some ticks. So, and I forgot to bring that. I had called Dr. Fisher and so she had put her on a homeopathic as well. So I was really pleased with having her on that. So I'm just saying there are different things we can do, but we've got to be on alert at this time that the ticks are very, very, I mean, it's damp right now, then it gets warm. So that's the perfect environment for them. So you've got to be responsible and be aware of this as well. So anyway, we're going to go in and now we're going to talk to Dr. Albert here, okay? Let, let me go back one okay. minute on the tick removal. Sometimes it's good to remind people to just be patient and not pull too hard, right. but just right. pull and wait and wait for that uh, tick to release. Yeah, pull it up, up straight. Because yeah. if you end up with the head left, cause if you pull too hard, you'll leave the head in right. the skin. And the suggestion, if that does happen, is take a needle or a very pointy, we use a number 11 um, blade, and just dig that out. Right, so that's a that good out. point, I forgot to mention that, yeah. And you always pull it straight out, and um, like I kept mine just to show Dr. Fisher, but it's okay, you know, I mean, we have her on some uh, supplements right now, her homeopathic, and I'll be well. So anyway, uh, Dr. Miller has written this book, and it's called You Can't Do That. And I knew that he was here last year in Worcester signing the book at the Worcester uh, Library, correct? Yes. The Gospel Bookstore yeah, and yeah. a couple and of places. And I wasn't able to be there. And so, thank goodness for Facebook, I found that he was going to be in the area again, down in Dover, Berlin, Sugar Creek, signing the books as well. So here he is 
he was raised Old Order Amish, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how this all came about. He um, was raised Amish, and uh, it's a true story, and it took you four years to write this book, right? <laughs> yes, we were a little bit slow. We would stop <laughs> right. and start. Yeah, you and your daughter, daughter have and written this, and Liz is in Brazil, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. So you were born in Kershockton County. And what's interesting, I grew up in Holmes County, so we're kind of right beside each other. So tell us about, you know, you were born and raised on Amish farm. So the Amish, are there different areas of the Amish? Uh, there are um, a, a lot of different uh, Amish. Most of you who drive around uh, see them all as pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. But there's the Old Order Amish and Swartzen Trooper Amish. and. As I was uh, growing up, a new uh, division of the Amish emerged called New Order Amish, mm -hmm. and that uh, has actually resulted in uh, a good bit of change. I will go into just a little bit about the difference between the Amish. The Old Order Amish, which was my sect, was largely uh, based on just doctrines, do what you were told, mm -hmm. uh, listen to the rules of your parents and the church. Uh, not so much on uh, reading the Bible and educating yourself about Jesus and what he did for us. We, we were geared towards believing if you do the right thing, then you hope that God right. will have mercy and let you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. The new order started having Sunday schools, Bible studies, uh, which we did not have as we were growing up. That was discouraged. And they have become much more um, liberal, if you will. The mm -hmm. more you read, the more you realize that there's nothing in the Bible that really tells you you have to right. be so conservative and so strict. Right, right. So right. it's been a nice blend, and they've they've kind of merged. And thankfully, um, my family, who initially was very uh, shunning towards me and didn't want me to be any part of their life, right. has kind of moved more towards some of the newer order beliefs, even though they're still right. old order Amish. Right. Yeah. Now you have 10 brothers and sisters, correct? And I they're do. all in the old order Amish still? All of them are, yes. Yes, exactly. And um, the good thing is your parents have instilled a firm belief in God and your work ethics. Okay, you're, I, I think with that good foundation that helped you survive to get where you are today. Correct. That has given me the ability to, um, uh, shall we say, the stick with itness of it and the right, determination. Right, right, right. The goal. Um, yeah. Maybe some people think of it as stubborn. However, I uh, grew up working and and doing whatever your goal is, and my goal ended up being getting through college right, and eventually right, medical right, school. Right. Right. So I, I will say to people when they ask, how could you do all that? And I says, well, you know, you never miss what you never had. And so when I went to Kent State and I went to University of Cincinnati, unlike most people who feel the need to go to all the sporting events and mm -hmm. be great fans, I didn't have that need. Right, exactly. So I went to work instead and had the ability to mm -hmm. pay for my college and Yes. make it through. Now, your church in the Old Order Amish is led by a bishop, correct? Where, mm -hmm. you know, like in different churches, they call him a preacher, maybe a priest, whatever. Yours is called the bishop. The, there's right? the bishop, and then there's two preachers okay. and a deacon. So there's four clergy members in okay. the Amish church. So one. what does a deacon do? Then your father was a deacon, which made it a bit more difficult for you, correct? Yeah, a little that more is strict. Correct. That right. is correct. The rules are set primarily by the bishop. Well, mm -hmm. they all, everybody has some influence in it, the, the other preachers. But when somebody uh, is um, misbehaving and not doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing for the <laughs> church, it's the deacon's job to go talk to them okay. and tell them, you know, yeah. you need to. So the pressure fix was on, way. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I understand that, yeah. So, you know, and growing up, 
you know, you got up early, always was seeing the sunrise. And so whenever you were like, what, six years old, you started doing different responsibilities? Yes, we started doing uh, some chores, simple things like feeding the horses and the pigs. That's easy and mm -hmm. getting hay down from the hay right. mill. Right. And then the next job was to learn to milk the cows. We milk their cows all by hand. Right. Which they can no longer do, by the way. So They use the electric, you they, know. They, yeah. they have to. They can't sell the milk uh, otherwise. Oh, really? So, Didn't mm -hmm. know that. So that's how that changed. It, it, in, when I was growing up, you could sell milk to be used to make cheese. So mm -hmm. it all went to the local cheese houses. Uh, now you can't do that unless you have a closed system and a constant temperature control. Right, they have so the bulk have, tank. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Do many of the Amish sell the milk? They do. Do yes. they? they? Okay. They will sell it to, most of them still is going to cheese houses. Yes. Okay. okay. But it goes in a bulk system, and they've adapted to, they can't have electricity, so they have a generator uh, or a solar lamp in okay. some cases, and a generator to supplement. Right, exactly. Okay. Now, um, I know when you were growing up, you had a neighbor that he used the tractor. Is that correct? That is correct. And you yes. used the horses to plow the garden, mm -hmm. right, in the fields. Mm -hmm. I was, as a little kid, I remember I would be going to the fields with my dad. Um, I would be guarding the water bottle for him, and he's plowing with a single yeah. farrow plow. And yeah. my neighbor just over the hill is... Uh, <laughs> plowing with his tractor and yeah. he has two and later he would have four okay. things at a time that was so he did a lot and I was wondering why can't we have that because that same neighbor also had a telephone and he also had a car mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when we had a sick animal or one of us was sick we would go call his the doctor or the vet mm -hmm. and then if we needed to go to the doctor we would ride in his car to go to the doctor because right. it was too right. far for the horse and buggy. Hmm. So. so when you ask the questions, what did you say? Did you ever ask your, uh, especially your father, you asked most of the questions to him rather than mom, right? I did, okay. yes, my father uh, mm -hmm. being the deacon. I mean, I would always, why is it that we can't do that? Why do we, it, it's endless, the questions that I w would ask. Right. Why can we only have three buttons on our shirt? and? Right, uh, right, right. So forth. But you never got answers. It's just that's the way it is. That's right, the way right. it always was. Now, at home and in your community, what kind of language did you speak when you were growing up? We sp spoke Pennsylvania Dutch, a uh, German dialect. Okay. And all of our uh, songs and Bible was in German, high German, which also made it a little more difficult <laughs> to, to, because those are not the same languages. Right, They're similar, right, but not right, the same. right. So um, then as far as your, okay, after what? First grade, you started public school. Yes. And you were really blessed to have that opportunity. Am I correct? Yes, I was blessed that we lived at the edge of the Amish community, too far away for their parochial schools for us to be The one-room school, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we rode the school bus and went to Keene Public School. It's an elementary school. I did that for the first five years, mm -hmm. and then there was a school built closer as more Amish people right. were in the area, and we uh, uh, spent grade six, seven, and eight at the uh, parochial school, Green right. Ridge. How was it the transaction, because you at home were speaking the Pennsylvania Dutch, and here you are on the school bus with all of these Amish children? Were you having any difficulty with, you know, the transaction from going to English to Pennsylvania Dutch? It, it, was, uh, it was a rapid learning when you go to school. Everything, everybody else spoke English, so only my brothers and sisters okay. were the only ones that uh, spoke right. Pennsylvania Dutch. So we learned very quickly. We would have uh, a, a, a few occasions to practice with my brothers and sisters who had already been in school and knew English. Mm -hmm. And also with the, uh, Mr. Parkhill who picked up our milk, we would uh, try to ask him about the weather and oh, say yeah. good morning yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. So we yeah. had a little right. practice. Yeah, exactly, interesting. Yeah. So whenever you did go then to the Amish school, it was a one room house, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you had approximately like maybe 30 students and you had four different grades, correct? Eight different grades. Eight grades, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So how did yeah. that work? Um, 
it, w our teacher was a uh, Amish person who graduated from the same school, so we didn't have certified teachers. Okay. But he would teach the different classes sometimes, uh, uh, and, and while he was teaching other classes, we would be doing our studies. Mm -hmm. But the class was kind of divided uh, uh, four and uh, younger grades and five and older grades on okay. one side of the okay. room. Okay. Some things we did together, uh, like reading German and having right. German spelling. Okay, so nice, that we very did. interesting. So um, the last grade that you went to at the Amish school was eighth grade. Yes. Eighth wow, grade. and here you are a doctor today. Mm. This is amazing, this is a great story. I mean, when I read your book, I couldn't even put it down, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, what did you do? You could go on and continue through the ninth grade. Now, how did that uh, all transpire? Well, I did not leave the eighth grade thinking I want to be a doctor yet at that time. Mm -hmm. I uh, left, however, the eighth grade thinking I want to learn what's the right thing to do. What uh, to to get in, what, what do we do to get into heaven? How do how do we um, what do all these rules mean? Right. And I was determined that I was going to sort that out one way or another. Uh, never got the questions answered, so I told my father that I was going to get a job when I turned 18 mm -hmm. and uh, I was going to get a car and I was going to see if I can find some solutions which I did uh, and still trying to see if he would talk with me along with uh, Mose Nisley one of the preachers but they wouldn't so eventually I said to him okay this is what I'm going to do I'm going to get a Bible and I'm going to get it in both German and English mm. so I could read it yeah. better and I'm going to give myself one year I will read it from Genesis to Revelations and if I find a reason for me to be Amish then I will come home okay. sell my car and be Amish okay okay well at the end of that guess what <laughs> I didn't okay so so you got your first job at 18 at the mm -hmm. lumber company hip yep lumber, hip lumber yep. okay and you had no problems getting a job, right? Because mm, no. of your ethnic background, right? Yeah. Being Amish, they knew you're. Yeah, th we were known to be uh, very hard workers. Reliable and right, hard workers, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So, now, whenever you started working there, you were still li living at home, correct? And I found it interesting in the book saying that your father wanted half of your paycheck. Is that mm -hmm. correct? It, it, yes. The the Rule. I couldn't leave until I was 18, first of all, because my father could make me do whatever right. he wanted. And as a tradition, the uh, children in the Old Order Amish will give their money to their father, mom and dad, until they're 21. Okay, all right. So I made a deal that I would uh, give him half as okay. long as he let me stay at home. Right. And he kept telling me I couldn't stay at home, and so one January evening, the door was locked when I came right, home. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. So, first of all, tell me, what? how did you go about getting a car? How did you learn to drive the car? Well, um, we lived, as, as I mentioned, at the edge of the Amish community, so pretty much the majority of our neighbors were farming uh, with tractors and were not Amish. And there was a gentleman by the name of Owen Brenly mm -hmm. who we would sometimes work for. We'd help him do some right. things on his farm. And uh, I decided I would ask him if he would teach me how to drive, mm -hmm. to which he said he would as long as I make sure my dad would never find out. Right. So, because he knew that would harm his Right, right. It friendship. would harm, yeah. exactly, yeah. And so you started out driving a tractor. Driving a tractor and <laughs> then uh, the pickup truck in the fields yeah. and then the car on the road. <laughs> right, interesting, that's so fun, mm -hmm. okay. So um, then, so you purchased a car yeah. and uh, you told, wouldn't park the car though at your house. Yeah, I knew that was not gonna be okay, so, but I told my dad I was gonna b come home with my car that particular day and that I would be parking it at another non-Amish neighbor right uh, mm -hmm. up. His name was Richard Slagle. Mm -hmm. And I parked my car and walked the, what, quarter mile home right. from there. Right, nice, nice. But then um, what happened? Uh, eventually you went home and the door was locked. It was a, a Sunday evening late. The door 
was locked. My mom and dad were waiting inside. Okay. Um, flashlight came on. And I should say that because many of you are probably thinking, what's so unusual about the door lock? Did, it, did you not have a key? No, we did <laughs> never lock our No, exactly. I, I grew didn't up know that way too. No, we never locked our door. Yeah. So they uh, said, I can't come in unless I promise to sell the car and act like I'm supposed to. I must confess, I said a little lie and said, okay, I'll sell the car. And then when they opened, I said, okay, I'm sorry, I need clothes. I don't have anything to wear right, except for what exactly, I had on. Yeah. So um, we negotiated that I could sleep there that night yet, and then after that I would be gone. So mm -hmm. that was... So you got your clothes, had no suitcase, bundled up what you could. Carrying them in my right, arm. Right, exactly. Wow, wow, yep. wow. And then I think probably when I was reading the book, you had attended a, a wedding for one of your cousins. Yes. And we had a little problem there. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that, that was in the book I referred to that as the day I quit being Amish. Yes, yes. And by that time I had pretty much read the Bible through, and there were a series of things that led up to it, however... I went to my cousin's wedding. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get an invitation at my house, but cousins are generally right, always invited, yeah. and I just assumed that I was invited. Mm -hmm. But I was told that I was not welcome there. And uh, we had a little discussion, but ultimately uh, I was asked to leave right. um, rather affirmatively. Right, right. We'll just say that. Right. I went to the hospital and had a few stitches. Right, exactly. Yeah, I read that. Oh, my, my. Mm -hmm. So that was the night you decided, I am no longer Amish. Yep. So you were pretty much just like, they didn't want you around. They stayed, you know, just kind of shunted you, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> there, okay. there would be occasions <coughs> that my parents would invite me home, and uh, the letter would always say, the others are also coming, meaning my siblings are also right, coming. Right. And right. those would be the times that I would usually then be cornered and, right. shall we say, just... Um, so whenever you, um, you went to live with a friend after you were locked out, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you found an apartment in Berlin. Yep. So you and had, had to wait two paychecks before I could oh, get wow. an apartment, but wow. we did. So how was it adjusting to another culture? Was it like another country that you would move to or adjusting uh, and not being in your own surroundings? It, it was uh, an adjustment, it, yes. The biggest adjustment was learning how to dress. Uh, yes. we, we had no color coordination things, right. so that was a big adjustment. And thankfully, I was in an area where there were other um, people that had left the Amish and I uh, associated with a group called the Holmes County Post High Group. Right, And right. that was a multi-denominational uh, kind of uh, youth group that had Bible studies and gatherings and some fun events. Um, we even went to Pittsburgh one time. I remember I was really excited about that, <laughs> thinking yeah. that... That was a really <laughs> <laughs> big trip, right? Yes, exactly. I thought that was a big yeah. trip, but little did I realize what it would be like living in a big city until I went to Cincinnati. So Right. So whenever... Um, you were in the uh, youth group. Most of these kids went on to college, correct? Mm -hmm. And there were some people that you had met through this youth group, and one of those was um, Ernie Hirschberger, correct? Mm -hmm. And you tell the story from there. <laughs> well, there are three dominant people that kind of uh, steered me. Uh, John Schmidt, and many of you will know John Schmidt because he's a singer and uh, and. Eli Hostetler. Eli Hostetler was Amish and had left. Okay. And then Ernie Hirschberger, his parents were Amish, but he was never Amish. Ernie was the one who um, said to me, well, Bert, if you could do whatever you want, what would you do? As everybody was leaving for college and we were right. saying goodbye. Right. My response was, but I can't. Yeah. And <laughs> just to not uh, dwell on it, right. eventually he said, just forget about all that. If you could do whatever you want, what would you do? And at that time, I said I'd be a dentist. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, why don't you? And long story short, next morning he picks me up and we go to Highland High School. Right, and right. I get set up for the GED test. Yeah. 
Yep, exactly. Yep. Interesting. And you passed <coughs> the GED test mm -hmm. and waited patiently for the news coming through the mail. Yep. And you felt like you won the lottery, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> and okay. then the next step was going to college. And of right. course, I knew I was going to go to Kent State because there was a branch campus. At Tuscarora's uh, camp, Tus campus, yep. correct, Close. right. And I know you were very, very blessed to have a good consular as well at Kent State. I believe her name was uh, Joanne Miller. Yep, Joan, Joan Miller was uh, the psychology professor at Kent State. Mm -hmm. And since I did the GED test, she gave me a, a series of tests that were required to enter. And at the end of that, she, uh, she was very friendly, very nice, but she did say, Albert, had you thought about the vocational school? <laughs> and I said, well, I have, but I feel I need to give this a try. Right, right. So we tried that, and he, she introduced me to where her office was, say, come anytime you have any questions or concerns. And I went to visit her about halfway through the first quarter. The intent at that time was, I said, Joan, I've come to say thank you and, uh, and goodbye, because I don't think this is for me. I think you're right. Maybe a vocational school is better. Right. And she immediately said, well, sit down, Bert. Tell me, right. tell me what's going on. Right. I thought I'd see you long before this. And uh, she asked, how are you doing? And I said, well, I, I don't think I'm going to do any better than C's in any of my classes. To me, C's were failing. I right. never, right. I never yeah, got Right, yeah, because you were used to getting A's mm -hmm. and B's, and that was, you would not, yeah. And to that, she said, my goodness, you can't quit. Right. I, I thought you'd be failing by now, but uh -huh. think of what you'll do next quarter. If you get C's right. this quarter, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, I stayed, and then I had one C at the end of that quarter, and the rest were B's, and I never nice. had another C nice. in my life. Nice. So. Yes, and I know that the Akron Beacon had written a great article about you in 1979. Yep. So this is where your education really started at Kent. And uh, you, first of all, you went to Kent at the branch mm -hmm. for two years. And then main campus. And then you went up to the yep. main campus. And did you live in the dorm or what, where did you live? No, actually I bought a trailer. I bought a trailer. And I lived in a trailer. I was being very conservative. I yep, was taught yep. to manage my money. And I had a roommate to help right. know, pay, pay for things there. And so I stayed off campus and worked at the local hospital up there. And as I graduated, I don't know who contacted the Akron Beacon Journal journalist, but I got a call from her, and she asked if she could interview me right. and put yes. a, do an Great article. article. Yes, very so good. That. So whenever you were going to school, you worked full time as well, correct? Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. So where did we work? Uh, while I was at Tuscarawas Branch, I worked at Union Hospital. Okay. And at, at Kent State, I worked at Robinson Memorial Hospital. Okay. And I would later be an ER doctor there. Oh, really? <laughs> that was Small my first world, ER. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So when you were working as an orderly, you worked as an orderly at the hospital mm -hmm. while you we were going to school, correct? I did, yes. And then. Um, didn't you become friends with a particular yes. doctor? Dr. Kenneth Van Epps. This was right. down at Union Hospital. Um, he actually had married an ex-Amish girl, so I found my uh, story kind of interesting. And uh, he invited me to his office. I was at his house, and we chatted. But uh, again, a long story short, then I decided, hmm. I want to be a doctor, not a dentist. It would be, <laughs> That's when it all started. I, I want to be involved with all of the human body and right, not exactly. just the teeth. Yeah, nice. So that shifted things a little bit. And Were you nervous about getting, you know, okay, so we graduated from Kent. Were you nervous about trying to get into medical school? I, I was. And again, Joan Miller and uh, several other professors at Kent State uh, were really, really great coaches. They okay. uh, kind of told me things I should do, one, get involved with some research and um, help me do my application. Yes. And then in particular, Joan Miller and another professor said, now just expect that you'll probably get a rejection. Mm -hmm. And when you do, you should call them and ask for an interview. 
Okay, good. So I did that. Okay. <laughs> I, I did get a rejection at the University of Cincinnati, and I had applied there for early decision, which means they decide yes or no. Yeah. So that was my first choice. And they granted me an interview. Um, and after the interview, which was long and very... Uh, <laughs> very intense, inter right? Very intense. Very intense. I came home very nervous. Uh, <laughs> but approximately two weeks later I get a letter in the mail and uh -huh. it's very nervous about it, opening it but yeah. when I finally opened it and saw the first word was congratulations it was nice 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 well that had to be a major change from going from college to medical school number one is location you were in Kent which is a much smaller mm -hmm. area compared to the city of Cincinnati yes correct yes so and then here you are we have no, um, you know, cell phone that tells you directions how to get there. How did, did you read the map or what? I, I read the map okay. and, I, and I got there and again, God has always provided right. what was needed for me. And okay. there were, um, because of this article at the uh, Akron Beacon Journal that got syndicated and it also appeared in Cincinnati Magazine. Oh, really? So I got a, a letter from a doctor down there uh -huh. um, and his wife, Don and Ann Knopfsinger. Okay. And they offered to help with anything. Nice. But nice. I still went down there thinking it would be just fine. I'll just go and get a paper and find an apartment. So oh. I go down there and get a paper and it's not like at Kent or at Millersburg where you, where you open the paper up and you look for apartments. There are oodles of sections, Clifton and... Yes, and where uh, do I go, right? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. which one of those is. So I called the Knopf Singers and asked if they would kind help of sort you. out. Right, right. What, what's close to, to the medical school? And they, they helped me, and I Good. found a, Good. an apartment within walking distance of the medical school, Right. which enabled me to not have to have a car for the first two years, which is mostly science. Oh, nice. So did you park your car? Yeah, I sold my car. <laughs> you sold your car, okay. And then on the third year, when we did um, clinicals, we were ri had to drive around to hospitals and right. so forth. So I bought a Chevy Chevette okay. uh, at that time. It's a little economical car. Right. So Nice. Very yeah. nice. So you graduated from Kent State in 79. <clears throat> yes. And then you graduated from uni uh, Cincinnati Medical School. In 1983. 83. Wow. Wow, I can see why you have written this book from the Old Order Amish to where you are today. So when you graduated from Cincinnati Medical School, what direction did we go? I, I initially wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I didn't get matched into the orthopedics. And as it uh, turns out, it's probably all for the better. Uh, I did a surgical internship in Cleveland and then went back to the University of Cincinnati and did family medicine residency. Okay. Um, emergency medicine residencies were, that specialty was just evolving during that time, so there weren't mm -hmm. uh, residencies yet. Okay. But I did emergency medicine and family practice as I graduated uh, from that and started in Millersburg with Dr. Roy Miller okay. for the first year. He was a great guy. But at the end of that, started up my own office in Worcester. Okay. Nice, very so nice. Was there until 2008. Okay, very good. So, God has been good. He has provided and guided you. The directions and the doors opened up as well. Um, so, you were in the medical field in Worcester for 10 years, and then you decided to go into ER work, be an emergency medical doctor, mm -hmm. correct? I, I mean, I've always done emergency medicine along the way, but I closed my office and did only emergency medicine in 2008. Okay. Um, and I started in 1988, so mm -hmm. that, that was about 20 years that, right, exactly. that I had a practice yes, there. Yes. And now I've been practicing a little over 30 <coughs> years, and I'm thinking towards retirement. So. Right. So, but when you retire, you are probably only going to work maybe one or two days a week, right? In the well, ER. Well, I'm going to cut down to probably, yes, uh, five to eight days a month for, okay. for the next year right, or two. Right. And then I think I may actually kind of retire altogether. I'm looking into other things to do. Right. Um, 
I may start doing um, life coach and health coach okay, stuff. Okay, nice. A little bit of that. Uh, a little more into the alternative? Yes. Is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because when you were and maybe in... maybe write another book. What's that? And maybe write another book. Well, yeah, because we talked about that. Write another book. Mm -hmm. You know, I think yeah. that would be really, really interesting as well. So um, your thoughts on the holistic health. Do you kind of like to blend the two of them together in the medical? I mean, we all mm -hmm. need our medical doctors. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to put you on well, the spot. No, no, that's uh, perfect. But w during my practice, uh, my family practice always had a, a somewhat of an alternative health bend to it. Okay. Uh, I used uh, exercise diet and uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids and right, other supplements right. to try to get people's cholesterol control right, instead right. of medications whenever possible. Not that I didn't use medications. And now when it comes to diabetes, when you can no longer control it, medicine is a very important. Well, yes, absolutely. And blood pressure, very, very, right, very right, important. Right, right, The There are diabetes and high blood pressure are the two probably primary diseases that it's very important to keep control because if you don't, and that usually requires medicine when diet alone and exercise fails. Right. Um, because if you don't, you end up with kidney failure, being on dialysis. Now, there was a time when I was uh, in Ohio still under a, a good bit more stress, and my blood pressure, I will say this, was getting to the point where I was concerned and thinking mm -hmm. maybe should I be on medication. Mm -hmm. I decided to lower the stress in my life right. and uh, work hard at that and diet, and my blood pressure has not been a problem right. Right. in the last 10 years at all. Um, thankfully, I'm really not on any prescription medicine right. except for I take a testosterone supplement now. Right, absolutely. Other, other than that, I take no prescription medicine. That, I think that's great. That's great. And um, I agree with you. I mean, especially being a diabetic, that can lead to many issues. Heart yes. disease, I mean, it's just ongoing there. You've got to Heart get Heart disease, the, kidney disease, and blindness. Those are the yeah, big things with exactly. diabetes. And it all goes back, a lot of it, to the diet and moving. I know our daughter had gestation diabetes. And when she would exercise and walk, she controlled it with mm -hmm. diet and yep. exercise. So that's amazing. So um, you have how many children now? You have, what, six, four of your own? I have four biological children mm -hmm. and two stepchildren. Mm -hmm. And nice. they are scattered all over the country and <laughs> right, the world. Right, right, right. The daughter who co-authored the book with me lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Okay. She's getting married uh, coming up soon, April or May. The date's not exactly set yet, okay. but I just talked so, to her. So you'll be going over there for that? Yes, we will all be going over there for that. Nice, yes. nice, uh, Hopefully, nice. Hopefully, uh, the whole family will be right. able to make it. <clears throat> so you <laughs> usually come back and visit your roots, your family, your sisters and your brothers, okay? A, a couple times a year or? At least once a year. Okay. Sometimes twice a year. And then do they have cell phones? Do you talk to them? I'm just curious. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Amish have changed so much. Yes, they uh, have. I wasn't even allowed to have a bicycle. Right. Now they have electric bicycles. You couldn't have a bicycle. Oh, I no, didn't know No, when that. I was growing up. Oh, now my. they have electric bicycles that they <laughs> get around and uh, they have cell phones. So yes, most of them have cell phones, and the ones who do not still have the old thing. The first thing that the Amish did with phones was have like a phone booth. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah. On the farm somewhere, mm -hmm. and and you leave a message there. So a few of my siblings still have that, but uh, several of them, especially the ones that are involved with other businesses, they right. all have cell phones. Right. Yeah, because I'm sure, I know when we had dinner the other night, your wife said it's very interesting when you talk to your brother. We're talking Pennsylvania Dutch and we're talking English as you're talking, correct? Yes. So yeah, it goes back and forth. Do back and forth. What I find when I do speak to them in Pennsylvania Dutch in order for it to really work, I need to start to think in Pennsylvania Dutch. Okay. And okay. kind of, then it rolls off right, the tongue. Right. Not, now, um, I do see that you do some um, missionary work. Tell us about that. Do you do that? My wife and I um, started doing missionary work after we moved to Alabama, and we became involved with a fairly large church. Um, it's, a, it's a Methodist church, but that's not important what the denomination is. Right. It offered the opportunity to 
get involved with missions. And we started uh, to be part of uh, the Panama Country Mission Group, in sp specifically the Nobe Indian tribe down there. They had been doing this for a little over 20 years now. And by they, I mean not just our church, but a, a group of different churches would go down at different times. Mm -hmm. And we have helped them um, migrate from bathing in the same river as they drank the water out of. Oh my. To uh, getting fresh water to them. And we had a medical clinic and a dental clinic also at the same time. Uh, and then starting uh, just about five years ago, they started to help improve their housing a little bit to where they'd have a cement floor and walls to keep critters out. But right. th otherwise, the houses are still pretty right. much the same. We're not trying to change right. them. Um, <coughs> and as a result of that, they have become much healthier. We don't see the dysentery. Uh, they have also uh, started to be involved with the government's clinics, which before they did not trust. Okay. And so we have kind of worked ourselves out of the need to, um, f for them to need us from a medical perspective. Okay. But they still need some. So additional. how often do you go? Do you go like and what's a year? COVID stopped it. Okay. And there's been uh, two trips since then, and I did not make either of those. Okay. I did make a trip to Africa though. Oh really? Since COVID to uh, the uh, country Kenya. Okay. In Nairobi, uh, we were there for uh, about two weeks. Nice. A, and that was missionary that work was as well? Mission, mm -hmm. That's a, a, a baby center. And Africa's a very poor country. That was very, very eye-opening. Um, the baby center gets orphaned babies that were left sometimes just beside the road, sometimes oh at a my. police station, oh sometimes my. at a church yeah. or school. And they have... Um, rescued and placed. They were almost at 500 when we were there, so I'm sure there are over 500 mm. uh, babies now. Wow. So Interesting. Interesting. So um, <clears throat> do you plan on going in the next year back there? Uh, the church has another mission planned. Uh, I'm not too sure if I will go. My yeah. wife has decided it's <laughs> too long of a trip for her to go, so if I go, I'll have to, to go without solo. her. Correct. Right. Um, and there is a trip to Belize, uh, oh, so that we will either do, the, the church is fairly large and does multiple things, but we'll probably either be going to Belize or Panama. Uh, so you the next. Up, uh, provide the medical service if it's needed as well, correct? Yes. yes. The, the Panama, I, I was always uh, a part of the medical clinic there, and then mm -hmm. there would be other people who had been uh, at the same time doing what we call building the village up. I know so. we were in Panama in January, and one thing I observed, of course we weren't in the area you were, but <clears throat> I noticed there was not much obesity. They were a bit on yeah. the thinner side. Is that due to their diet, exercise? W what do you think it is? The food it, was excellent. It's absolutely uh, diet and exercise combined. Right. The They live... A, a, Everybody that we saw lived pretty much off of their own land. Right, So their, exactly. their diet yeah. was a homegrown stuff and Right, and they had lemons polluted. and abundant. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they're very active. They're, wherever they, they go, they walk. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily true in Panama City. Right, uh, right, exactly. There, there's a little bit. I think it spreads out that it's still pretty much right, right. activity and diet is nice. the key to health. You don't see nearly as much. Um, we see some, but... Uh, blood pressure or diabetes there as we would have in our country as well, a result again, of that. Well, again, it's back to our standard American mm -hmm. diet, and this is why it's springtime and we need to grow as much of our own food that we have the opportunity yep. to do that. It doesn't matter if you're in a home or an apartment. You can always put little pots out on your deck or by your sidewalk, yep. whatever. So before we close, we have like a, a minute. What would you like to share in conclusion? I mean, I think it's amazing what you have gone through and your experiences. I think it's amazing how your mindset, you had goals. Um, the, the name of the book, I want to say, is You Can't Do That. But I want to say it's titled that because that's what I was told by so many people. You can do that. I did that. So if you have a goal and you have a desire to reach something, if you set your mind to it and you pay attention to 
the people God will put in your place. Uh, listen to them and help. let them help and guide you. You will reach your goals. Mm -hmm. Just never give up. Absolutely. So, so you doesn't matter if it's large or small. May it be weight loss. May it be continuing your education. Have faith. Mm -hmm. Look where it has brought you. Persistence. Exactly. Persistence. Thank you so much, Albert. And when we write the next book, we're going to be back, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a deal. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy and be well. God bless. Thank you. watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.